Hey everybody, thanks for joining us uh, today. Or to begin, sorry, I want to say happy VJ Day, victory over Japan. Uh, I know it's a first world war topic, but uh, uh, VJ Day is something close to my heart being the Hong Kong study that I do. So uh, everyone, I was at the uh, ceremony that was done in Ottawa today, if you want to check that out on the channel uh, as well. Um, you can go and check that out after. But uh, so today is Hill 70. So it's often known as the Forgotten Battle. Talked about a bit on Twitter a couple days ago about that. So that's kind of what we'll be talking about a little bit. We're going to be doing some photo stuff because Carla Jean's here and uh, she does an excellent job with that. And we have Melissa. So uh, let's get started. Hey, guys. Hey, Brad. I'm Melissa. How's, How's it going? It's going? That's good. How are you? Good, good, good. Yeah, it's finally nice weather. Looks like in most of the country, so that's that's good. I are you, do you have any smoke where you are, Melissa? Yesterday was pretty bad. Um, there was ash on my car, and mm -hmm. you could walk outside without getting like a sore throat. And I think yeah. I'm four nice. hour drive away from like where the main stuff is mm -hmm. happening. So yeah, but today it's much clearer. And the sun is shining. It's very hot. Um, so apologies if you can hear my fan in the background, but. Um, I will need it to stay cool. <laughs> awesome. So we're going to start off. Uh, Carla, that's cool. You start off. Um, yep, for sure. Talking about it. Hold on. I'm just having one technical glitch here. Give me a second. Hey, it seems to be my technical glitch day, which I'm not enjoying. Carla, how is it where, where you are? Is it a, oh, it's, it's better? It's really worse? gross for a couple of days. It's a little bit better today, but. Wildfire crews are anticipating like huge winds, so it's going to blow in and blow out, and so that's not the greatest. But well, oh well, we got good. outside this morning, and that was nice. Oh yeah. good, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that's good. Okay, so uh, you want to start us off talking about um, for sure one of your uh, best buds, eh? My William Ryder Ryder. Do you want to go to that next slide, Brad? So uh, what happened? It, it, if you guys have heard me talk before, um, talk a lot about Canada's first World War photographers, William Ryder Ryder was the third one that was hired. Uh, he came on onto the the team. Um, <laughs> we're seeing them all in reverse. How exciting! The blur. Um, okay, there we go. There he is. He was appointed sort of around June June of 1916. Um, so he was the third of three official photographers. We say he was so nice. We named him twice. No idea why his last name is Ryder Ryder. Uh, it makes him really, really hard to do any like genealogical research. But anyway, he was born in 1889 in Stamford Hill, London. Uh, he remembered as a little kid, sort of the first historical event um, that he remembered in London was the end of the Boer War. That was sort of like a formative memory for him. Obviously, um, I don't know if you remember Queen Victoria's funeral, that would have been around that time too, a little bit later. Um, yeah. As a kid, somebody gave him a, an old, not so great box camera, and that's how he got started with photography. And that kind of crappy box camera really inspired him to think like, one day I'm gonna get a really good camera and I'm gonna be a photographer. So that's how he got started. Um, he did attempt to enlist as a soldier in 1914, but he was found unfit for active service because he had problems with his eyesight. So he became a phys ed instructor. And like decades later, he remembered he really liked taking soft men and turning them into soldiers. So he's a real guy's guy. Um, he loves to name drop later on, like saying I had lunch with Curry today. And, and so he like, he brings out these big names, he says he photographed King George V. And um, it's really, it's important to him that he knew those people. Um, yeah. So in 1917, he's appointed as an assistant to Canadian official photographer, Ivor Castle, but Ivor Castle actually goes back to London pretty quick after that. Uh, he's in and out of the field for the rest of the year. So basically he hands the reins over to Ryder Ryder who photographs every major battle from what we're gonna talk about today, the Battle of Hill 70 onto the 100 days um, ending up on November 11th. So let's see. And then in May of 1919, he was kindly asked to escort all of Canada's thousands of glass plate negatives back to Ottawa uh, where they live today. So like I said, Hill 70 was the first major engagement that he photographed. Um, do you wanna to go to the next slide? I, I have photos here and I don't even know what they all are. Oh, good. Um, I think this is the cover. 
No, it's not. I'm lying. Is it? No, it's not. No. It looks really. Does everyone have their copy? Huh? I don't have. Uh, <laughs> I have a digital copy. Yeah. <laughs> I have a sleeve for mine, so it doesn't have the beautiful photograph, but I saw Oh, shucks. <laughs> okay, so um, Ryder Ryder, he commented later that he had a really, really hard time photographing the Battle of Hill 70 because of the terrain. So we do know that they were attacking near a chalk a chalk quarry or a chalk mine. It's a chalk mine it for chalk. chalk. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I think we can see it in a lot of the photographs, but it's super hard to say because they're black and white, obviously. And it could be like overexposed. It could be any little thing, but when you look at it, it looks chalky. So then it's a way that we connect the photographs with the oral history, which is really cool. Um, so he remembered spending time with the 102nd BC Regiment Warden Warriors. Um, and he again drops the name of, of the lieutenant colonel, lieutenant colonel, because we're Canadian. Yes. Uh, <laughs> so he said the ground was chalky, the barrage made it look like a snowstorm. Um, he's waiting for it to clear so he can actually take photographs. So we now know there are over 80 photographs that are sort of related in any kind of way. Battle of Hill 70, subsequent attacks on Lens, just sort of like everything even tangentially related to that. It's really hard to say what's actually just a photograph of the assault on Hill 70, um, just because that's not the way that they're organized today and because it's such a hard time getting really any battle photos. Mm -hmm. Okay, do you wanna keep going, Brad? So these are just some more of that chalky terrain that we're talking about, so just keep going. Okay, so. Your favorite. If, I've talked about this photograph so many times. Um, if we want to, like, we often hear that the Battle of Hill 70 is classified as Canada's forgotten battle. Um, and Brad can probably talk about the poll that he had posted on Twitter the other day asking people if they sort of agree with that or not. I would argue that Canadians tend to remember certain battle names, even if they don't maybe know too much about them. And we have certain iconic photographs from the First World War. This one from a series called Over the Top is definitely one of them keep going we have a few more so the taking of vimy ridge um so these are both by ivor castle and then if we keep going william Ryder Ryder's photographs of passiondale later in the year are definitely in my opinion a lot more famous um and i think we have one more from passiondale yeah this one so so if we say that those are all really famous photographs from battles that some Canadians can name, Bimmy Ridge and Passchendaele, even if they don't know that much about them, I would sure. simultaneously make the argument that there aren't really any famous photographs from the Battle of Hill 70. Um, if we go one more, I want to get your guys' opinion. I was looking at all of my thumbnails, and so a small, small format of the photos, and this one kind of jumped out at me and I was like, I think that one people have seen before. So I wonder if you guys, does it look familiar or is it just the composition of, of two people walking on a pathway like it's a German and a Canadian? Well, does I it look that. familiar or no? Well, I mean, yeah, if people can answer it or watching, that would be awesome. But uh, I, I clearly, I've seen this because like, I think, I, I don't know if we talked about this last time, but I was doing um, I was doing a project I kind of abandoned, but trying to look at all these different um, victories. Mm -hmm. And Hill 70 was the difficult, most difficult one to find just literally anything that's like definitively, like you said, Hill 70 or like anything that like you like you're we're trying to look at here, like can be remembered or connected or anything like mm -hmm. that. So like, uh, but I mean, to me, like this kind of photo might not even be this one, but we see it a lot, right? With the POWs. Yeah. Um, coming back in the line, yeah. with usually helping a wounded Canadian, right? To that's I mean, right. Maybe talk yeah. about this later, but to not get you know something bad happened to him, right? We see that's that right. Line. Yeah, we are going to see that a lot in the photos. Yeah. Um, I don't remember if if I've seen this one through the colorized photos with the Vimy Foundation, but um, that's the only thing that jogs my memory. Mm -hmm. is seeing mm -hmm. color, ironically. Yeah, um, it is. A beautifully composed photograph. I, if I'm going to just talk about my personal opinion here, it's that Ryder Ryder, in my opinion, was the most talented of Canada's three photographers, even though um, I spend a lot of time talking about um, 
Ivor Castle. So Paul Reed is just commenting that the photo is described as 100 days because it shows open ground. Interesting. Yeah, yeah that's an interesting thought to think mm -hmm. about. Yeah. Um, so we see that the, the pathway is running like right through the center of the photograph. Rider Rider standing right in front of his subjects for the most part. So they're centered right in the frame. Um, he makes us feel like we're actually pretty close to the action. We don't really necessarily feel like observers. We feel like they're going to walk pretty close to us. Isn't there another famous shot of a wounded Canadian without a German soldier? Um, there's a lot of, we're going to talk about it. There's a lot of photographs of wounded Canadians specifically taken um, at Hill 70. Yeah. Okay. So although I would make the argument that Hill 70 doesn't necessarily have really any very famous photographs, um, it is significant in a lot of ways. First of all, it's the first major engagement of Canada's third and most prolific photographer, Ryder Ryder. He also specifically remembered photographing Hill 70 decades later in a pretty sort of really useful interview that he had with Canadian archivist Peter Robertson. Um, so it's something that like he, he talks about for quite a while. Um, and then he actually saved a program that he received when he attended a dinner that uh, the Warden's Warriors also attended. So he kept that and now it's at Library and Archives Canada. So it, it seems like it was memorable to him, even if it maybe hasn't been memorable in the popular history of, of Canadians in the First World War. Um, do you want to keep going? So there's this dinner program. Uh, it's really cool when you go to Library and Archives Canada and, and they have a little William Ryder Ryder phone and you can like hold his stuff. And yeah. if you're a giant dork like me, then it's exciting. <laughs> yeah, I always so, love being able to hold the, the documents. And I just want to say these things, I'm sure other people have noticed this, but these dinners, like, because they're always usually kept, right? They're always, they're kind of these mm -hmm. holders. Uh, I like, my favorite part is that they name everything, right? Like they throw a name, like it'll be like, Passchendaele beans for some reason. I just think that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> like some, some of them are really menu. good or like they're really good puns. Others are just like, yeah, it's like uh, Hill 70 biscuits or something. I don't know. Anyway, sorry. <laughs> that's hilarious. Yeah, I think that's funny. Um, so like I said there, if we're looking at kind of all the photographs really widely related to Hill 70, there's just over 80 of them, which is actually a pretty decent amount. Uh, if we think about the Battle of Vimy Ridge, there are about 150 photographs of that. Um. So, like I said before, we see a lot of the chalky terrain that Rider Rider talks about. Um, if you keep going, there's a few of the photographic captions. They specifically tell us that the photographer and his subject and his subjects are really close to the front line. This is a super common theme that we see in the entire oeuvre of Canadian official First World War photography. It's that we're being told we're really, really close to the front. We have no way really necessarily, well, we do have ways of knowing if that's true, but it takes a lot of sort of cross-referencing um, different different things. Um, but it's, these are <laughs> shrapnel balls. Um, that's a good one. It's a way of making the photographer seem really brave and it legit, legitimizes his work. So let's say his photos didn't turn out super great, although I think that they did. The Canadian War Records Office would then tell us, well, even if they're not great, look how close he is. Um, yeah. So it's just a tool that they use over and over and over again to legitimize the photographs. Um, and so we see it in a few of the different captions in this collection. It just caught my eye. Um, so so both of these just say we're, we're just really close to the front, even though they're like, you know, eating some food and stuff. Just sort of funny. Um, if we keep going... I just want to say, I think it's interesting too, but I think this is in the same vein. The idea of this a badly wounded soldier. Mm -hmm. He's standing there drinking coffee. Exactly. That's right. And <laughs> yeah, we're going to see, just... see that again for sure. Um, it's a common theme that if you're going to photograph the wounded, that um, they better not actually look that bad. Or at least they yeah. better be smiling. Um, <laughs> another, yeah. so... When I want to understand a body of work, I'll usually catalog it myself. So this is a screenshot from my catalog, which I also shared earlier this week on Twitter. Um, so I have thumbnails for all of them. Normally, I'd have their MECAN number, which is the, the internal number used by Library and Archives Canada. But I was just moving really quickly, so I didn't take them all down. Their O number is what negative number they are within um, the collection. So O stands for official. And then the number is generally chronological order, but within a battle, that's not necessarily the case. 
Um, then we have the title. And so this is what caught my eyes. That depending on who was who was naming the photographs, and it's sort of a combination probably between Ryder Ryder sending in some notes along with his negatives, and then somebody at the Canadian War Records Office would type out a caption list. But whoever's doing the work has used the word Bosch so many times. <laughs> I don't think we use, we don't see Hun very much. It's pretty much always Bosch and it's in like a lot of them. I think it says 29, 29 instances out of 80 yeah. photos. Um, it, se it, it seemed excessive to me. So I had sort of a chuckle over that. But when we think about that in sort of a bigger picture sense, why, let's say writer, writer, so when writing, writing the captions, um, why does he feel the need to use the word Bosch specifically? when a viewer looks at a picture of a German, they know who the enemy is. They know we're fighting a war against Germany. And the Bosch, the Bosch, the word Bosch is just <laughs> pushing that a little bit further. So the photographer and the Canadian War Records Office and the press are saying, don't forget, like, we're, this is who you're not supposed to, you're not supposed to like this person. Yeah. They're bad and I'm telling you they're bad and we're just pushing this further. It's like the solidifying that message and it's really a deliberate use um and so once you you read a lot of photo captions like thousands of them then you'll notice that deliberate use of language um so if we keep going so this is my breakdown of i just gave all of the photographs a really basic subject um you can spend a lot more time doing this. So this is sort of just like a preliminary look, but so out of the photographs, those with their main subject as Canadian soldiers is about 26. Canadian soldiers with animals is another 10. Canadian soldiers with civilians is another four. Canadian soldiers with the dead, there's one with a grave. So it's not even a dead body. So that's pretty sanitized yeah. and so on and so forth. Um, so 31% of the photographs are showing Canadian soldiers doing Canadian soldier things, which we, we take that for granted that we're gonna see that in a collection of Canadian official photographs. But 16% of them show us wounded Canadians. Does that seem high? It seemed a little high to me, but not really when we think about rider rider style overall. So I did a similar exercise a few years ago with his photographs from Passchendaele and with just like really preliminary numbers, I found that 40% of his photos from Passchendaele are of wounded Canadians, which is really high in my opinion. Mm -hmm. But this is all within my lens of having spent years studying Ivor Castle at Vimy Ridge in which he shows us 6% of the collection are wounded Canadians. So what does it all mean? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> basically, in my opinion, what this is actually showing us is that Ryder Ryder has one way of how he's gonna photograph a battle and Ivor Castle has another way. And then of course, Canada's first official photographer is Harry Noble. They all have a different way that they're going to approach the job of photographing war, which is like the soapbox that I live my life on, which is that we always need to name our photographer <laughs> because they're going to show us something different. Yep. Um, so Castle, when, and I've talked about this a lot before and this is, uh, he predominantly portrayed Vimy Ridge through showing us POWs and captured weapons. So if he's saying we won the battle of Vimy Ridge and this is how we won it, although we also won the battle of Hill 70 and, and Passchendaele, but Ryder Ryder's portraying victory in a very different way. So again, this is why it all matters. Um, Canadian can official- for, Can yes, I just jump please. in real quick with a yeah. question? Because you mentioned um, that Ryder Ryder describes the oh. conditions of Hill 70 as difficult to photograph because of yeah. the shock. And That's I'm right. sure anyone who's read about this battle, even in a, a slight way, knows that artillery and all that played a major role here. Yeah. Making it, yeah, like they said, like a snow globe or something. Now, I'm thinking of, and again, like take your point about, you know, different styles and personalities, but I'm thinking Passchendaele, A, because is that the focus on the wounded, I guess you could say if it's 40%, is that because there's nothing else to photograph? I mean, anybody it could definitely there, be that. Yep. There's nothing Absolutely. even there today. I mean, it's just all flat, nothing. Right. Yep. So for sure. I mean, I'm just not sure if that plays a major role or if that's, yep. you know, matter of subject, I guess is what I guess I'm asking. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, they're always going to photograph what they can photograph. Right. So there's, mm. there's a lot of different a lot of different elements that go into this. And if it was a more major study, then that's what we'd really dig into. 
Um, and Ryder Ryder kind of talked about that in a in a written little written piece that he had for Canada and Khaki, uh, or Canada and Khaki. What am I thinking of? It's um, yes. Um, so yeah. the Canadian War Records Office put out three sort of large magazines that had essays and drawings and photographs. And then so the second and third issues each featured a little written piece, one by Ivor Castle and one by Ryder Ryder. We don't put it like we take that one by Ryder Ryder with a lot of a grain of salt because he later said that it was heavily edited by someone who's not him. Um, and he didn't like that they made him sound less brave than he feels that he is. Cause again, he's a guy's guy. Like I, I'm a man. I go photograph with the troops. I eat my dinner with them. Um, he's from really, Brooklyn apparently. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, so he didn't like that somebody made him sound less brave than he was, right. but he did comment on the connect, the conditions of Passchendaele and just that it was a, a horrible place to be. He also talked a lot about like the mist that had settled in the area when he, the night he was trying or the day or the night um, he was trying to photograph there. And, and so there's a lot of different conditions that will definitely play a role in the subjects that they choose to capture. Um, so I, I absolutely take your point. It's basically what I'm getting at there. Um, so official photographers, they were hardly given any assignments at all. Um, when we look at the records, there's like just a few. Ryder Ryder got asked to take a photo or a few photos of a certain kind of gun because the painter Richard Jack was going to put it in a painting. He needed like a study. Um, other than that, if we want to understand how they approached their job of photographing Canadians at war, we then just dig into the photos and, and take a look at what are we finding here and knowing that for the most part, they're following their own initiative. So if we keep going, I just have a few more of the photos that we can look at. Um, so this is, Brad, you already mentioned this. So this is a wounded soldier in a trench, but he's enjoying his cigarette, which is a positive thing. Smoking is great. All the Canadians do it. Um, yeah. And we're being told he's in a captured trench. So we're talking about like, it's a setback because he's wounded, but also it's progress because we captured this trench. Mm -hmm. So we're giving you a little bit of like the reality of war is that you will get hurt, but all is well because the Canadians are winning. Um, so it's a really deliberate message. And then if you wanna keep going, um, yeah, so I just have a few more photos that we can just kind of roll through here. Um, if you guys want to make any comments, definitely feel free. Just taking it in. Yeah, you can see an emplacement here, which I think is interesting. Um, so I think that's a clue, obviously, to that it's the enemy line. Mm -hmm. I'm always so amazed just like how crisp some of these are and how well constructed the images and how everything's sort of framed and I know you've mentioned this before Carla and I'm sure those that are watching that are photographers know as well you know how you frame the image and what you decide to leave in and leave out is so crucial um, so it's always interesting to see how these are framed um, and taken in the moment for sure if we look at this basically the the area that they're walking through is creating sort of a V shape and it's, it's vanishing right on the man who's right in front of us. So Where's it's a really, down. that's right. Yeah. yeah. So it's their yeah. leading lines and it's creating a, a specific perspective essentially. Um, mm -hmm. So it, it's creating visual interest that goes all through the frame. Um, but the main subject is the people right in front of us. So a newspaper then can actually just zero right in on them if that fits their editorial layout as well. Mm -hmm. Oh, we keep going. Yeah. Um, so this is a similar, similar Here kind of again. composition. <laughs> yeah. Um, Same sort of thing running through it too. That's right. Um, there, are this one and another one that I'm not sure if I included both point out that the the people that they're encountering are young. So mm -hmm. there's another one. I'm not sure if I included it, but it it says like a I'm young sure. officer. That happens it, a lot, I think, with with Hill Seventy. Uh, I think, you know, I mean, like, I, I think that obviously that goes on more and more as the war goes on. Mm 
That's right. I think like Hill 70, yeah. in, in my mind, I mean, obviously I look at this, then probably you say the average person, but it, it's where this kind of, uh, how do you say, like the narrative overall turns, right? Because Vimy Ridge is these solid experienced divisions who have, you know, been through everything on the Western front and then they're playing that up. I mean, we talked about the Vimy myths and everything on another show, uh, but mm -hmm. it, it seems to be like kind of a turning point. I don't know if I'm kind of uh, off on that, but it seems to me like, yeah, Hill 70 is like, they're young, they're inexperienced, but we're still pushing forward, but the enemy is weakening in a way. I don't know if that's just me, but... <laughs> Like the, the the description of young too, I think can also, and I mean reaching, but just a, a, among initial observation, but sort of alludes to experience, like you were saying, not only in yeah. experience of, of warfare, but just age too. Um, True. You know, we just have like these veteran Canadians that have been in it, they know it, and we're slightly older, and um, yeah, I don't know, that can... But it is interesting yeah. to see the picture of young and old too. Yeah. yeah, I think again, it's a really deliberate use of the caption, mm -hmm. saying, "Look at look who our feeble enemy is." They have to pull out yeah. like their kids, um, and so we have to think about like the message is always really calculated. Mm -hmm. Oh, for sure. I just want to go back because Paul makes an interesting um, observation that it looks like it's. Uh, I mean, Paul's gonna know. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, um, well, yeah, yeah, for sure. That's why I want to go back. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I could be, I'm not too sure because I don't know the, like, I can't identify from the background of a photo like Paul can, yeah. uh, not for this battle anyway. But uh, yeah, it, I mean, it, it makes me think about something interesting I just don't want to forget is the connection that I'm sure we're going to talk about when we get into Melissa's stuff, but the, the connection to the fighting in 1915, right, and, and the British, yeah. uh, the, yeah. the battle there and all that stuff. I mean, it's part of the Vimy kind of lore, myth, whatever you want to call it. But it's part of the Hill 70 stuff too, but it doesn't get talked about as much. So I think it's it's a good reminder yeah. for us to not forget about what all of this means. But again, as we're seeing here, so I'm going to just take, take a second from Carla talking here and, and how the narrative is formed, right? And photos play a huge part in that, as Carla's talked about a ton, um, with how it's in newspapers and everything, usually even faster. I mean, that's a big theme. Uh, in the Hill Capturing Hill 70 book, which I have a link in uh, below in the description. Check it out if you don't haven't read that book yet or want to get it. Um, it, it it's about this, how the narrative is formed quickly, um, like Vimy was, but it's done differently for some reason. Or it's not as captivating to Canadians. But anyway, I'm getting a little ahead of myself, but I just don't want to forget. <laughs> I don't want to get take more from Lisa, but I just don't want to forget that because sometimes I have these big themes I want to get talking about and I forget because I get too excited. But anyway. We can go back here. We'll go on to the next one. So I include this one really just because it's Rider Rider really at its finest, where he gets right into the trench. He wants us to feel like we're there. We see this a lot in his photography. Um, and I'm projecting, like I'm making myself think I know what he's thinking. But when we look at enough of his photographs, um, it seems like he wants to bring us to where the action is. And that's a really different approach from Ivor Castle who really prioritize the aesthetic of a scene. So he's standing far away. He's composing this big scene from a specific, a specific vantage point. He doesn't care about making us feel involved because that's not important to him. He's an artist and he's showing us like this wide thing um, mm. and creating those specific vanishing points. So I just include this again to just make a comment on this is Rider Rider right here. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I'm going to jump in again because Sheldrake 6 makes a, a, an interesting point. I think it was about a previous photo. Sorry, I'm going to get into the nitty gritty military stuff here. but That's okay. <laughs> that's what I do. Uh, the clearing of the trench, I think, is an interesting way because, right, because there's this myth again of the, you know, artillery, First World War, what that means. We have the image of the Somme, none of it works, that kind of thing. But the mm -hmm. clearing of the communication trench, something put that dirt in there. So I would assume it's got to be the effectiveness of the artillery because. Right. It's again in every account and in every kind of anyone's I've seen, both sides, the mm -hmm. artillery is like a prominent role in this. Yep. And again, I don't know if that comes into play with visual narratives or anything like that again. Like, could he just be doing it like he said, because he's an artist? But I don't know. I, I mean, it's part of it. It, it may be, yeah. indirect, but it seems really interesting that something like this, which you don't often see, right, is a clearing of a communication trench. Because honestly, who cares about a communication trench? But 
it's uh, it's it's just something interesting to think about too, of the actual battle part and how that plays into the narrative. That's right. So this, I mean, this could be an amazing project for somebody where where you do take the the war diaries and the plans and mm. all of these different pieces of primary evidence, and then you marry that with the photographs and see what's where's the connection, yeah. and you will find it. Um, we know from the plans of the battle that it's a very specific, like a bite and a hold. We're going to assault the hill. We're going to take two divisions up. I think I'm not an operational historian. Yeah. Yeah, too. <laughs> um, and we're going to consolidate those gains. We're going to aim for trenches because that's where we can consolidate. So yep. with just a really basic understanding of this battle, we can then, and the fact that they attacked near a, an area where it's really chalky, that's going to be in the war diaries. Like it'll be in the planning because they know what the terrain is like. So we, we absolutely can bring all of these things together. And it's actually a really beautiful thing when different types of primary evidence all kind of complement each other. So I mm -hmm. think you make a great point. Yeah, it's it's an interesting avenue to explore. So if someone could get on that, that would be appreciated. <laughs> all right, this one, this one yeah. it's just a beautiful photograph. It's actually a little bit later. It's in September, but it's in the same geographic area. Yeah. But just it's just gorgeous. Um, and the composition is ace. Uh, so we have rider riders standing really low, which is why we have sort of this out of focus chunk of land in the most immediate foreground. And then we have mm. the four bodies and then the bayonet sticking up. So it's, it, we have the foreground is creating this one shape and then the bodies are a, a secondary shape and then the, the background. It's, uh, it's just so beautiful. That's the only reason why I added it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you've done that before. Um... I mean, again, like you, I don't want to assume again, but like, as you mentioned things of like overexposure, that kind of thing. But I think this one is a clear understanding, even though if it is later of what the battlefield looked like, right? Yeah. The, the chalkiness and the, what, it, what I assume, I don't know, in my mind's eye, when I think Hill 70, I mean, it doesn't look like this anymore, but yeah. you know, it, in my mind's eye, this is what it looks like, you know? For sure. Yeah. And we see chalk, it's dry, all that stuff. Yeah. yeah, we see that over and over again in the photographs for sure. Yeah, pretty unavoidable, I, I would exactly. think. Exactly, yep. Okay, you got anything else, Carla? Or wanna... um, so we'll let Melissa talk um, about the memorial, and then I just have a few screenshots from um, the Canadian War Pictorial, so it's Hill 70 in the press, and we can talk about that a little bit as well. Yeah, oh, that'd be great. That'll tie in really nicely. I'm just going to move a few things around on my screen, so bear with me a second. I've got okay, two now, screens. Open. Yeah, so, so now we're going to get into the, the the good part. Sorry of uh, how it's remembered. Does that mean <laughs> I'm just kidding? You, know, I'm joking. No, because oh, like you mentioned, you mentioned earlier, right? When I when I put that Twitter, my as we like to say, our very scientific Twitter polls um, mm -hmm. uh, about you know about the memory and all that, and and I think this is one battle that like a lot of people said those in the know know, but also it can have an emotional response. Um, yeah. You know, uh, and Hill 70 does. And I think that that says a lot, but we can get into that. So sorry, sorry, Melissa. Oh, no, all good. It's, uh, my screen is very crowded, apparently. <laughs> so my computer is, you know, when it like lags a little bit as you're yeah. dragging stuff across the screen. Well, the windows, anyway. you must be a historian. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm on a Mac, it's even worse. Anyways, um, so I'm going to, mostly talk about the memorial and sort of this evolution of um, Hill 70 as some as a battle that we commemorate um, and the memorials that have been created um, about Hill 70 throughout the last hundred or so years. Um, so unlike Can other Canadian battles, like we've talked about, like Passchendaele, Second Eve, and of course, Vimy, Canada's fight at Hill 70 often floats at the edge of Canada's collective memory of the First World War. It's there, but like we just mentioned, it's sort of if you know, you know kind of thing. Um, similarly, as we've already talked about, um, the fight for Hill 70 had these elements of a Vimy-esque type victory. So you have, you know, Curry at the helm, this battle explicitly fought, and won by the Canadian Corps, the taking of a German stronghold that nobody else could get, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but the battle fell short of its legacy making potential, even though it can easily be argued that Hill 70 is a more important battle than Vimy Ridge. And it can also be argued that it's a bigger core defining battle than Vimy or um, others up until that point. 
And I just want to clarify what I mean by this legacy making potential is I'm talking about just like we're saying in the Twitter poll, you know, at the forefront of everybody's a memory of the war. So whether you know the battle, what it's about or not, you can say the name that's in every textbook, that kind of thing. Yep. Hill 70 rather holds a scattered legacy, I think. Like it's remembered in pieces, similar with the photographs. Like we know the photographs, we maybe don't know that it's connected to Hill 70, um, that kind of thing. Um, and there's a good intro quote of Serge Durflinger's um, chapter in the Capturing Hill 70 book, which if you want more details on what I'm talking about today, that chapter is definitely one you should go read. Um, but he mentions Hill 70 never developed a strong profile in the national narrative of the war and did not enter Canadian public imagination in the same way Vimy Ridge or Passchendaele did. However, in recent decades, Hill 70 has been pushed back into the national uh, narrative of the First World War with endeavors such as the Hill 70 project and the recent um, construction of the Hill 70 Memorial Park in France. Um, another part of the Hill 70 project is Matthew Barrett's um, comic sort of history book. There's a talk about that for the Maple Leaf route. Um, I'm not sure if it's up yet, but that's another piece that you can sort of look to. Yeah, when it is, I'll link it. Uh, I think yeah, that would be great. Weeks or two, yeah. um, and even, I'm not sure if there's a link to the actual comic, but that would be worth reading as well. It's really, it's a really interesting project and it's really, really cool. I enjoyed it. Um, but as many of you already know, Hill 70, again, like other prominent Canadian battles, did not have a national monument overseas until 2017. And unlike the Vimy Memorial, the Brooding Soldier, and those cube memorials that are scattered across France, uh, Hill 70's uh, memorial was not state sponsored. So what I mean by that, it's it's not paid for by the government, um, but it was a community. Uh, it was similar to the community memorials in Canada. It was funded by private donors and members of the public. Um, but I'm going to talk about that more later at the end. Brad, if you could hit the slide for me, that'd be great. Um, so immediately following the battle in 1917, Hill 70 was earmarked by the press as an important milestone for the Young Canadian Corps. News, uh, newspapers across the home front wrote a victory in France and extended their congratulations to the Canadians for another impressive conquest against the Germans. In typical fashion, and I currently study newspapers and war correspondence, so I'm gonna, I love reading this kind of stuff and seeing how correspondents cover um, Canadian, Canadian First and Second World War, but they sort of follow this typical um, cycle of you uh, report on the victory, then you follow it up with these personal pieces, um, sort of acts of bravery and heroism, and then to sort of to cushion the casualty list that will come later. Um, so when the details of the gruesome fighting were released about Hill 70, combined with those casualty numbers, an uncertain victory surrounding Lens, which I know was in the Twitter poll, you know, what about the, the other battle, which <laughs> I don't know enough about to speak to. So, <laughs> Brad, if you have anything about that later, feel free. Well, uh, I got some thoughts on that. I figured as much. Um, but yeah, so the grouping of that together and this uncertainty, uncertainty there, the buzz in the press surrounding Hill 70 began to dwindle. Nonetheless, with the conclusion of the First World War, there was hope among veterans that Hill 70 would take its place as one of Canada's most important victories. But it wasn't easy, um, as we now know, living in the present. Um, but for one, Hill 70 almost wasn't named as a battle honor for the Canadian Corps, which I always think is very interesting. Um, Curry had to sort of step up and, and write a letter to the National Defense. Um, and secondly, as I mentioned earlier, Hill 70 was left out of the National Monument Project and arguably, I think, um, left out of the National Commemoration Plan altogether. Um, for a short time in the 1920s, certain tunnels and trenches at Hill 70 were preserved and used as a tourism draw. Um, during this time, the site was even visited by prominent Canadian politicians and veterans, but never in an official pilgrimage capacity. But it wasn't open very long and it quickly was closed by a local mining company. And I tried to find photos of this at, you know, it used these trenches being used as a tourism attraction. And I couldn't find any. Um, but then again, I've been kind of on like a crunch timeline. So I may have not just looked in the right places. So if anybody has photos of that or knows of any photos of that, that would be really cool to see. So 
let me know if anybody knows. <laughs> <laughs> and I put, sorry, I, before I forget, yeah. I put Carla and Melissa's uh, Twitter in the description. So if you do, hey, if you want to help, uh, yeah. help us out, uh, you can get in touch with Melissa through that. Yeah, that would be great. All right, next slide. So uh, much like the commemorative war uh, work done during the interwar era, the Battle of Hill 70 was memorialized mostly at the local level within individual regiments and communities that held a special connection to Hill 70. Um, there are a few examples, but I think this one is very interesting as somebody that researched a lot about monuments and memorials um, specifically. So in 1925, the municipality of Mountain, Ontario unveiled a local memorial dedicated specifically to Hill 70. Like many local memorials constructed uh, during the 1920s and 1930s, the Hill 70 monument in Mountain was a community endeavor. So entirely planned, fundraised and constructed by the local community. There's a lot of really interesting stories about um, monuments and memorials being built in Canada by these small towns and municipalities. Some of them have some really crazy stories, but um, yeah, so the, those trenches, again, I read about in Durflinger's chapter in capturing um, Hill 70. So that's where I learned about it first, but I haven't um, seen any photos. Um, oh, maybe, massive flash of photos. I have no idea. It was sh like, like I mentioned, it's, due to this um, extension of the mine um, in France was mm. why it was closed down. So they restricted access to it. Um, so people could still go, but it was from my understanding, not encouraged. Um, but I don't know much else about it besides that. Um, but yeah, these uh, local um, memorials constructed across Canada. Some of the stories are really interesting. And if you are interested in just knowing some funny kooky stories about the construction of small town memorials. It's some small town politics at its finest and I've got some great, <laughs> some great stories. So uh, let me know if you wanna hear more about that at a different time. Yeah, we could do something <laughs> with that later, yeah. Yeah, but those memorials were con um, entirely constructed and, and fundraised and planned by the local community. Um, and Canadians across the country were really eager to create these memorials to commemorate fallen soldiers of their towns and municipalities, um, mostly because public outcry for government-sponsored memorials had gone unheard up until the 1930s, and communities were in need of a place to mourn since their loved ones were um, buried in France um, with the Commonwealth War Graves Commission having the policy of where you where you die is, is where, you, where you're buried. Uh, many Canadians had a hard time with the fact that they wouldn't be able to go um, if they didn't have the chance. And plus those cemeteries, and please correct me if I'm wrong, um, Brittany Dunn, if you're out there, you can correct me. Um, I'm pretty sure the cemeteries weren't opened until the late or mid thirties. Um, so even if you wanted to go, it took some time to get there. So like many of the First World War um, community memorials across Canada, this Hill 70 monument and mountain uh, went through a few changes over the years. So this in the photos is how it looks today. Um, but the original memorial just consisted of the captured German gun and the two flank stones with the inscriptions and a large electric lit flagstaff inscribed with Hill 70 at the base. In the little plaque, excuse me, in the little plaque next to the memorial, it states that all the electrics for the flag staff were donated. And this was a big point of contention as well as the 22 acre land that the memorial sits on the park um, was purchased by somebody within the community. So it really is a full circle, um, really is a full circle project. So in 2011, the local Lions Club in Mountain invested in a big revamp of the memorial. They added two black granite plaques, which you can see sort of on the side. I'm pointing at my screen like you can see me, but you can't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, added, added two black granite plaques to highlight the space um, and how the memorial was built um, in the park. And this really continues this tradition of community based engagement with memorials and um, coming together at the local level to create 
these spaces of remembrance and commemoration. And I should note as well that it's not as common to see community memorials dedicated to a specific or a single battle. Um, I've only seen it a handful of times. Generally, you have your local memorial is an overall of the First World War with additions of Second World War, Korea, Afghanistan, you know, and the like. Um, I do want to know if anybody goes to their local memorial, if there is like a flank stone of Hill 70 at their local memorial. I don't have one in Maple Ridge, um, but I check. And I'm interested to know where these are, because apparently there are more, but I don't know where they are. I don't know about the stone per se, but I, I have family in Kingston. Uh, I, okay. I think I posted it. Yeah, I did post it on Twitter. I can't remember when, a couple days ago, maybe. There's a, a monument to the 21st Battalion, uh, and theirs has Hill 70 on it. Um, which is rare to see in my experience in Ontario anyway. The ones I've seen hardly ever mention um, Hill 70. I mean, this one was quite it, uh, quite extensive. The paddles I listed, I mean, I listed almost all of them. Uh, but to me, that's, that's, it's, it's fairly rare. Yeah, and that's in my case too. I don't see Hill 70 often listed on the memorials. Um, it's a lot of those, again, um, you know, Amiens, Second Eve, the the battles that we know in in in, in the textbook essentially yeah. um but yeah if you are walking past your local memorial uh do let me know if you see a hill 70 marking or go look for it because i'm sure it's not easy to find i'm sure it's not the first one on the top or the bottom <laughs> no <laughs> <laughs> it's just probably hidden around a corner or something right um yes <laughs> so next slide this is my last one yeah, um, as I mentioned previously, until recently, the Memorial on Mountain was the was one of the only monuments dedicated to the Canadian Battle at Hill 70. Um, I think it was the only one, um, but uh, I'm not too sure. I haven't been able to double check that. So with the unveiling of the Hill 70 Monument and Memorial Park in France, uh, that changed in 2017. For those of you that haven't visit the, visited the memorial yet, um, I tried to include some photos that I have from when I visited in 2018 with the Canadian Battlefield Foundation. Um, they go with every tour to visit the memorial. Um, so we kind of got to walk around and see that. But an overview of the park is also drawn up at the bottom. Um, so you kind of go up the, there's two pathways to get into the park. And uh, one is, dedicated to uh, Frederick Lee, I believe. And the other one is dedicated to Philip Conwell. Um, so these two paths go up to the park and then there's these little um, maple leaves entrenched in the pathway, one maple leaf for every Canadian killed at the battle. And then there's this giant amphitheater, which is that uh, um, stone slab in the middle with the Canadian maple leaf and then uh, the monument at the top of the hill. Um, a fun fact, actually, about where the monument is, it's not at the top of Hill 70, it's at the bottom. The top of Hill 70 is a two-lane roundabout um, on the front of the <laughs> So uh, when we went on our tour, we were given extra drives through the roundabout just to really, like, let it sink in. Yeah. A few of us got a little dizzy, but uh, we made our way out and down to the monument all right. And it also has a nice view of the prison. <laughs> Which is also yeah. on Hill 70, and the industrial park, which is aesthetically so pleasing, the two of them. But uh, yeah, the roundabout is uh, about as good as you're going to get now. And it, and that point, oddly enough, kind of ties in to my like final concluding points about this memorial is that it is a modern national memorial. And it's interesting to me because it is so different from... Fimi Ridge or Brooding Soldier or the Cubes because it's meant to be interacted with in a way and it's in a whole different landscape. So the, the monument at Fimi Ridge, you know, um, Alan Walt, um, Alan's Memorial and um, all these different places, it's sort of meant to be a stoic place where you observe and you um, sort of think inward. But the Memorial Park at Hill 70 is asking you to interact with it, to read, you know, these welcome signs. And I know that there's a guided tour that you can use um, if you have your phone with you or access to the internet or you download it from CBC, I believe. 
Um, and there's all these uh, little, with the, all these little touches like the maple leaves on the, on the pathway and such, like it's, it's asking you to interact with the memorial, to sit, to contemplate, to use it as a park, um, which a lot of these early memorials don't do. So it also shows the evolution of just commemoration in Canada and commemoration as a whole, which I think is really interesting. Um, a really good article about the evolution of, or chapter, the evolution of memorials and how um, they can be looked at as sources or how the community and public interact with them is Jonathan Vance's um, uh, Documents in Bronze and Stone. Um, sort of like lays it out really interesting and a lot of it can be applied here to Hill 70. Um, but yeah, the monument and the park are quite new. I do recommend going to visit if you have the chance. Um, like the little comments that I saw popping up, there's some interesting neighbors and, and things around the park. Um, but once you get into the center of the park, the way that it sort of domes in, uh, you're sort of in your own little space. So um, it's really, really interesting to visit. Yeah, cool. that's what, that's the end of my notes. So I don't go too <laughs> Okay, so Carl, you said you wanted to look at some of these. I, yeah, I just brought up a few screenshots. These are from the Canadian War Pictorial. So during the work, uh, the Canadian War Records Office had three kind of large, big, fat magazines called Canada and Khaki, and then four smaller little pictorial magazines called Canadian War Pictorial. So I quickly looked at the number four one last night. And so number three is pretty much entirely devoted to pictures from the Battle of Vimy Ridge. There's maybe three pictures in the entire number that are not Vimy Ridge. They're like Battle of Arlu at the end of April, 1917. Mm -hmm. And then Canadian War Pictorial, I'll send you this, Melissa, if you don't have yeah. it, you'll like it. Um, great. <laughs> um, it really shares time with a few different things. And I'm sure there's something to do with the fact of like, what were the Canadians up to in early 1917? Um, Vimy really taking the spotlight there. But then later in the year, we have a few things that we need to talk about. And so Hill 70 is one of them, but then it really transitions into Battle of Passchendaele as well. Mm -hmm. So this is not the same approach to representing the war that we'll see earlier in the year, where we had the entire battle in one issue. We see like, uh, we have Passchendaele, we have Battle of Hill 70, and then we have like general scenes behind the lines. Um, so we do see Hill 70 represented in a, in a healthy way. Like there's a lot of photos, but it's not the only thing. Yeah. So I'm honestly just throwing that out there if we're again circling back to this question of was Hill 70 a forgotten battle, certainly not at the time, as Melissa has pointed out with her um, her newspaper clippings as well. Um, I do, I think I have the, the super scientific poll pulled up somewhere. No, I don't. Oh, crap. Anyway, um, it was something like 48% 48, 48 of people that answered the poll. I'm going to pull it up. 49 said yes. Yeah. And it is, it is a forgotten battle, mm -hmm. allegedly. Yeah. And it is interesting because I've been on Twitter this morning looking at who's posting. So I'm following like hashtag Hill 70 and it's not very much at all. And we did this exact same exercise for Vimy Ridge when we were streaming about it. And there were like dozens and dozens of tweets yeah. from all of these different official accounts, Everybody. like official government. Um, Everyone. Yeah. Exactly. Every, all this, like, it was like, I don't know, Corrections Canada and Battle of Vimy Ridge, you know. It was, That's right, yeah. <laughs> yeah it's, it's sort of like, um, and I don't want to minimize how important it is to tweet about things like Pride Month, but like when everyone's profile picture becomes a rainbow, it's sort of like Vimy Ridge is like that too, where it's like, like yeah. your Toyota dealership's like, Vimy Ridge Day. Vimy Ridge, yeah. Um, Come buy a Corolla, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> there's more and more every year where you look That's and you right. go, oh, interesting. Okay, you know about this. So okay. <laughs> uh, I just pulled up the poll. It had 68 people vote on it. 48.5% um, of people say that Hill 70 was, was Canada's forgotten battle of the First World War. 23.5% of people said, no, it's not forgotten. 16.2% said, I don't know. And 11.8% said it's too complicated to answer, which is fair. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, because that's my poll, right? So I, I put, I don't know, because I haven't put that in last, at like other polls, and people are like, well, I don't know. I'm like, okay, sorry. So I put that in there now. But I think it, it's it's striking for Hill 70, because this whole thing we talk about, 
with Forgotten Battles, the part with Lens, which we haven't even talked about yet, and, and everything. I think it's just really yeah. an interesting mix because that's why I came up with that. I mean, yeah, usually when I do these these polls, I have a I have an end you know game in mind a little. Right. We're trying what I'm trying to you know get people to a usually talk about, but I'll kind of get a, as we always say the scientific and un, unscientific understanding of what people are thinking. That's right. And, and that's what I was I was thinking about because. Uh, the lens part to me, which was, there's a little bit on Twitter on that. I've made a joke a couple of times about like, well, yeah, we don't talk about that, but I, I think it's important. And, and I do want to talk about this because we're getting close to the hour and I don't want to go too much over, but to me, and again, this might be a controversial statement, but the, t like the failure to take lens to me plays into this a little bit. I mean, it's a victory. Yes. But because I was doing the reading yesterday um, in, in the Hill 70 book, about the you know the objective was lens it was not right. hill 70 it never right. was curry changed the plan as everyone who knows you know those in the know know like he did that again later i mean he did it at passchendaele he does it at canal de nord that kind of thing yeah comes up with his own innovative plan but then after that uh, the innovation kind of goes to the wayside he, he does that again at canal de nord uh, i mean i still think that's his masterpiece i don't think this is and that that's because of lens uh, it, it it's his objective. It's what he's ordered to do. And he fails to do so. I mean, yeah, they take pieces of the town, but the lens yes. is liberated until 1918. So to it's me, interesting. It's, it's, yeah. I'm going to interrupt you. It's interesting that yeah. you say that because he looked at it and he said, lens isn't going to be easy to get. And mm -hmm. so you're saying he didn't get it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, but I, it's not surprising. I don't think um, uh, that's all yeah. I have to say about that. Yeah. I mean, uh, I think it's also important to note like Hill 70 and, and Lens is squeezed between these two other like, yeah. very involved Canadian yeah. um, actions. So it's all like, I don't want to say it's the luck of the draw because it's, it's not, um, but it's almost like it's just in this weird spot as the Canadians are leading up to the last hundred days and, and, and really pushing and, and making this name for themselves as, as a core, where it's almost an afterthought because what comes before it and what comes after it just sort of trumpet in, in importance or um, in how one can tell the story. For sure. Uh, it doesn't fit as, as nice. So I've got a really big question here that I want to throw out before we don't, because this is an easy one to answer. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I mean, it's remembered a lot more than saying a lot because you say that to anyone, they'll be like, what are you talking about? Uh, I mean, True, no but one I've seen... I've seen Saint Elwa mentioned more on Memorial. Like, if we're listing battle names, you will yeah, see that I mean, one. Right. I meant more modern. Like, if you ask Canadians yeah. today, oh, uh, 100%. percent. They're not going to know which. No, they have no idea what about. They're like, what <laughs> is that in Quebec? Like, <laughs> um, but like, you know what I mean? It's a hugely important battle for Second Division. I mean, and it causes reverberations through the Canadian Corps for the rest of the war. But no one talks about that. So, yeah, that's the answer. Well, I mean, we, I don't even know if there's a show in that one. But, I mean, I could talk about this stuff all day long if you let me. But uh, I think it's an interesting way of thinking about it, too. Like, is there lesser known? Yeah, there is. But Hill 70 is this forgotten victory. And again, I just have this, this issue with it. Because, again, yeah, Curry said Lens isn't going to be easy to take. But he still tries to do it. And that's right. he's ordered to do so. So, I mean, in my head, that it's kind of, I still haven't really fully thought out my, what I'm thinking about it, but right. Like yeah. he's ordered to take it. He says, no, let's take Hill 71st. That goes well. I mean, as we all know, first couple of days, we go really, really well. It, again, the, the, the descriptions of the fighting are absolutely brutal when the Germans counterattack, because that's their doctrine in both world right. wars, right? counterattack right away. Curry knew they were going to do that and basically blew most of them off the face of the earth, yeah. but they still had to take lands. And he and just, so, it's like an afterthought. So yeah. Sheldrake has commented that we we assume the Germans will abandon Lens once the dominating ground is taken. It was the wrong assumption. You're 100 percent right about that. There were so many assumptions going into this battle, which Amen. exactly. Um, mm -hmm. So I just wanted to point out that that comment had been made because you're 100 percent right about that. Yeah, it's no, it's thanks, Carla, because that's kind of what I'm I'm thinking in a way because it's yeah. Because again, I wouldn't be saying like I would note note this, but I I know Curry does this later. Like he, yeah. he can do these set pieces. He can do them with the time. And even as the work goes on, he can do them with diminishing amounts of time, right? Because the 100 days, 
Yeah. He's doing some really good work on really short periods of time. That's right. But it's like he can have this initial concept. And again, I'm not trying to bash Curry to bash Curry. I'm just something of this course. I've noticed. Yeah. I don't want to get attacked by the, the, the Curry fans here. It's not what I'm, I'm trying to say. It's just playing, you can set up these set battle piece, you know, these set piece battles. And then he has these little objectives that he's ordered to take. And he's like, yeah, we'll get to it. But then, yeah. then that has impact on how the battle goes and the people who die in it. But anyway, that's just okay. what I've been thinking the last couple of days. And quickly, just to tie that on, like on the public perspective, the newspaper articles leading up to um, Hill 70 um, were sort of, you know, talking of murmurs of another Canadian offensive, that this is going to be another victory yeah. similar to me. Like this is like the public is waiting for it. And then it's this big thing. And then the press does this again where they're going, okay, it looks like we're going to take lens. Like same idea. It's going to be the same victory. Yeah. Just as um, we just discussed, like there was this huge assumption even in the public and the press. And so the, the failure to kind of take that and the fumbling of newspapers to sort of try and report it's another victory, but it's not. And, and making it so complicated, public loses interest. And then we fall into Passchendaele. And, and, mm -hmm. and, so. and I mean, I, I mean, we, and this is a bit of a little bit of a tangent, but I think it's unavoidable on a Canadian topic about the First World War that, you know, British Canadian identity, they're not going to be like, oh, we're only going to focus on Canadian battles. I mean, the fighting at Third Eep has already started. That's right. Well yeah. before this, it's not going to yeah. be like, uh, they're British. We don't care. That's not how most of yeah. them would, I would don't think I'm going to get jumped on for saying that would think at the time, right? The focus is going to be on this Titanic struggle that they know is Titanic at this point. And mm -hmm. It was going well up until now, uh, until yeah. the rains came, right? So I think mm -hmm. it's, it's something to be remembered too, that we can't have these Canadian blinders on when right. we talk about these battles. Like that's how we do it now, which I'm not a fan of. I'm sure that's not the first time I've said that on something like this, mm -hmm. but it's got to be remembered in context too. Like, well, yeah, Sheldrake Six already said that is Passchendaele's dominating the British media, mm -hmm. rightfully so. I mean, this That's is a right. huge battle. Um, yeah. But anyway, so, well, that makes me think about the one thing I did want to talk to you guys about is and I mentioned it earlier is the fighting in 1915. We see that mm -hmm. narrative with Femi Ridge, right? Sorry to the, if any French or Brits are watching. Uh, you know, you couldn't do it. You guys basically sucked at it. We came in here and like kicked their ass. You know. You have that here too. Uh, and I mean, it's incorrect in a lot of ways. And I think that's maybe why the stuff about Lens kind of gets me thinking about this because, that's yeah, right. the hill, yes. And they tried to take the hill in 1917, or sorry, 1915. And again, just like Vimy Ridge, they got to the top, but they couldn't hold it. But we did. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that it's part of the narrative that still survives to today. Mm -hmm. Those who even and know. And so that. we're seeing that as well to circle back yeah. to Curry's involvement is yeah. this. This yeah. uh, remembrance of this false remembrance of Curry, where it's like he did it his way, like he's Frank Sinatra of the Canadian Corps, and it's like <laughs> no, he, he that needs to be a shirt. <laughs> I know. The on on the same Canadian military history merch line is coming coming soon. Yeah, Carlos got um, some good ideas for me. Uh. I, want it, I want it on a mug. And so if like we can't just say that Curry was like, nope, I'm I'm throwing yeah. out the battle plans. Uh, it, it's a lot of give and take, and although, although he suggested that that Hill Seventy get taken first before they head into Lens, like this whole conversation, all it's all related. That's all. Yeah. 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 It's it's. I mean, Curry obviously is a towering figure in the First World War in Canada, and then you tie everything into identity, which we've talked about at length. I really shouldn't link the Mimi live stream down here because. I think as we talked about then, it just it's in part of everything. <laughs> you can't really avoid it. Um, but uh, yeah, actually, this is a really interesting point yeah. of what we're talking about because it's true. Um, that um, so discussions on attacking Hill seventy. I think Delaney yeah. and Durflinger. Uh, well, it's Delaney's introduction says mm -hmm. that yeah, conversation has been going on early early nineteen seventeen, and it's just sort of the mm -hmm. pieces are coming together in the right way. Yeah. Uh, that that and now the memory is that this is all Curry's not really the, not entirely the whole memory, but no. depending on where you go uh, yeah. and what you're looking at, it's like here's uh, Canada's first Canadian Corps commander. Uh, I'm saying that in a confusing way. The, the Canadian commander of the Canadian Corps, who is Canadian born? <laughs> Canadian uh, born, trained, all that stuff. Yeah, yeah. 
Um, <laughs> and this is sort of like his first trial and he, again, did it his way, yeah, uh, allegedly, great, but not. Great, and so, yeah. yeah. Anyway, so we're really, this is our, uh, this is our part of the show that's kind of shady. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, didn't, things. I didn't include in my little rundown of all these different things that um in places that commemorate hill 70 but there's a lot to do specifically with curry and and curry's involvement in hill 70 so it's like a memorial or an event there's even a sport trophy um mm -hmm. that is named after hill 70 but it has to do specifically because of that in organizations or initiatives um uh, association with curry so it's not necessarily a right. link to the battle, but linked to Curry. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I, sorry, I just want to go back because I think that's an interesting point. You're talking about Carla and Michelle Drake's six comment there about Henry Horn, the commander of the First Army, because he's, yeah, Passchendaele is going on 30, whatever you want to call it. He, it's not his battle. Uh, I mean, he's trying to hold his chunk of the line and he's focused on his objectives. So I think it's it's something that needs to be remembered uh, is yeah the canadian and i say this all the time and i'm not diminishing anything the canadian corps did at all but it is just one core out of how many like they were seen as interchangeable with all the british corps the australians too um it's just it's something that i think we have to keep in mind and i think hill 70 is a good reminder i mean i do think hill 70 needs to be discussed more but again, I don't want it to get sucked into the same narratives like Vimy and Canada. And yeah, Michelle Drake Six again yeah. is like speaking for me today. I should just let him do the show. Uh, <laughs> it's 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 this. It, it, it's that myth, right? That yeah. there are these chateau generals who don't care, don't know, or too stupid to know, whatever you want to say. And the Canadian, you know, those plucky colonials come in and we show them what for, you know. It's not true. It never was. So, I mean, it's just, it's part of this. And I just mm -hmm. get a little worked up about it, as I'm sure you can tell. But I think it's just, because I hate myths. They drive me crazy. My dissertation is literally about them. But I, I, and I think it's something not to be forgotten. And I think, like, the work you guys do with the photos and memorials is, like, the bookends of how this goes, right? Because it's how they start and how they get perpetuated. Um, it's it's something to keep in mind that Hill 70 is far more complicated than we think it is, how it's presented. Again, I'm going to push the book. I guess I do get a little commission, but it is a great book. I mean, I just got engrossed in reading the thing way more than I probably should have had other things to get done that I was trying to fight with. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so is there anything else you guys want to talk about? Any final thoughts? I think you said it, uh, I, for me anyway. Um, that we, we need to talk about it, but we need to talk about it in a way that's fact-based and not not talking about the mythology. Yeah, and just to cap in that as well, uh, you know, when it comes to memorials and monuments, the meaning of the memorial is always changing and evolving. And just because it was put up for one thing doesn't mean that in 50, 100 years, it will mean the same thing. For sure. We're really conscious of that when we're talking about these fact-based discussions and about the battle. Um, that these landscapes can be manipulated um, to contradict that purpose. Yeah, oh yeah, for sure. I think that's that's really a good way. Perfect. To <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think it's just true, and that has so many applications in our current times. But I'm not going to say anything about that because I don't want to get jumped on. But anyway, uh, thanks, guys. This was a really good one. Um, very different, I think, in the way we did it with looking at the photos, the, and then the, like I said, a bookend of memorials me as I ramble about things that I remember. Um, but anyway, so that's kind of how I like to do it. So I'm just going to talk to the audience real quick and then I'll uh, come say goodbye. All right. Sounds good. So thanks everyone for watching. I really do appreciate it. Uh, remember to subscribe to the channel. Every subscriber I get uh, really, really helps me out. Uh, I need as many as I can get. So if you can please subscribe to the channel, like the video, share this and all my other stuff with anybody else who might like it that is so greatly appreciated um so i have uh, my links to my patreon account and buy me a coffee if you feel like supporting financially uh that again helps me do all this work because i can't continue to do it without you guys so uh, any help you can provide is great so i'm um, not really sure what i got coming up because i've been in dissertation craziness so i don't have a full schedule yet but uh Something will coming up soon. I do have some things lined up, but they're not ready yet. Um, but I'll probably be announcing those uh, as they do come up and get solidified. So thanks again for watching and uh, enjoy the rest of your day.